Vamos a comenzar en lo que aparece ya el Weisman, que ha vuelto a desaparecer de mi eh, campo de visión. Eh, lo que, en lo que viene vamos a ir, a, a ir aprovechando para ir presentando la tercera y última de las partes de, de la tarde de hoy, en la que habíamos pensado que una buena manera de terminar era con un diálogo entre Matthew Fuller y el propio Eyal Weisman en relación a un concepto que ha sido motor de la exposición y que, es, y que para nosotros ha sido crucial y que tiene que ver con este de la estética investigativa o qué puede significar, que sería la pregunta que enmarca este diálogo, qué puede significar el desarrollo de una estética de investigación para ver el modo en el que las habilidades y competencias de distintos agentes que pueden venir de distintos campos de conocimiento pueden desarrollar metodologías en torno a un acontecimiento para, eh, para arrojar luz sobre él y cómo esto puede de alguna manera eh, transformar eh, el campo de la educación, el campo de la investigación y otros múltiples campos. Eh, ella el Weisman, que, es, que, estará, que es, está en, en el diálogo, bueno... Es una pieza clave dentro de todo el proyecto Forensic Architecture y es, eh, casi no merecería presentación, ¿no? pero bueno, es un arquitecto y es profesor en, de cultura visual en, en Goldsmith y Espacial. Y bueno, aparte de este libro que presentamos hoy, yo creo que es, cabe destacar un libro que acaba de sacar un tocho de libro, podría decir, en Sound Books, ¿no? que es Forensic Architecture Violence as the Threshold of Detectability. ¿No? Y bueno, en la hoja tenéis mucha más información de otras de sus publicaciones. Y Matthew Fuller es autor de los libros How to Sleep, The Art, Biology and Culture of Unconsciousness en Bloomsbury, de próxima aparición. Y también pues, queríamos destacar el de Media Ecologies, Materials, Energies in Art and Technoculture. ¿no? Matthew Fuller es profesor de estudios culturales y director del Center for Cultural Studies en Goldsmith también. Y es conocido por sus escritos sobre teoría de los medios de comunicación, estudios de software teoría crítica y estudios culturales. Eh, muchas gracias. Thank you, both of Thank you. you <laughs> y aquí os dejo con ellos. Yeah. We're going to talk uh, a little bit uh, in a dialogue, uh, but first of all, um, trying to try develop some, in, in that dialogue, to try and develop some um, overall kind of discussion Uh, about the themes of the uh, the exhibition and the practice of forensic architecture, but also to try and think what that means for uh, intellectual, cultural work uh, more broadly, what it means for forms of political um, debate, and what it means for kinds of institution and uh, forms of education uh, that work with these uh, new forms of representation uh, of evidence, of traces, of processes, and of, and of fact. Uh, but first of all, I think we're going to start with um, a discussion of a recent project, a very current project from Forensic Architecture. Yeah, so you know, this, is, this is really a, a fantastic opportunity and a kind of a, a ruse for Matt and I to, to develop a sort of an interactive piece around around some of those ideas. The piece that I wanted to, uh, that we wanted to um, to start with presenting is a piece that is now uh, presented at the Documenta. It's a very recent piece. Uh, in fact, most of it uh, in the production has taken place after the Makba exhibition opened. So really in the, month, in the, in the last uh, six weeks or so, a lot of the material has come together. And it is to do with a series of killings that took place in Germany um, between, two th between uh, 2000 and 2007, um, in which 10 uh, Germans from migrant background, mainly from Turkish background, but one person also from Greek background, uh, have been murdered in a series of undiscovered um, uh, assassinations. Uh, that were initially attributed to those very threatened communities themselves. So those, um, uh, the, the Turkish community in Germany, throughout this series of murders, all undertaken with the same gun, a Cheska 83, were considered themselves to be perpetrated, were put under enormous pressure. And although from the very beginning, the community itself realized that um, 
they were persecuted for on a racist uh, background, um, the police would not listen to it uh, and would not acknowledge that. The um, many people from the community started to organize in a kind of a growing collective. The more murders have taken place, the more family have gathered into that collective. Um, and part of it has coalesced with other German anti-fascist groups um, and instituted something that is called the People's Tribunal Unraveling the NSU con Complex. NSU is standing for the National Socialist Underground. This is the group of uh, a group at whose core there are three Nazis. Uh, two of them uh, killed each other uh, in 2011, and then it is only through 2011 that uh, the people realized that this was neo-Nazi killings. Um, when uh, we were commissioned to undertake this investigation, we were not commissioned to undertake police work. It's the police, uh, in fact, uh, in Germany, it's, it's, it's its own duty to establish who has done the killing, who has supported the killers, etc. But rather to investigate the police investigation. So, it's, this, is, this is one of the principles of counter-forensics that um, does not replace really the work of the police, but, but put the police here as the alleged uh, criminal within that case, mm -hmm. uh, or to check its involvement uh, within it and, and, and what might have been uh, the issues with it. Um, we were presented by the People Tribunal with the 11 cases of, uh, sorry, the 10, the 10 murders that have taken place. Um, they've by that time collected enormous amount of information that was uh, largely in the public domain. And, uh, and we, you know, I mean, there, there was no clear at the beginning, clear commission of what exactly we should investigate. And together, we realized that because of the limited means uh, that we had, uh, both in terms of time and money and uh, manpower, we decided to focus our analysis on one of those 10 killings, because within that killing, and that killing took place on, on the 6th of April 2006, in an internet shop in Kassel, same town where the documenta takes place, within this 77 square meter of the shop, there were three, or, you know, yeah, one of, each one of the three actors that together makes this, make this drama. There was the um, a German from Turkish background who was killed. There were the killers. And there was also, it later appeared, a secret service agent in the very same shop at the time of the killing. The secret service in Germany is like an internal security organization that is responsible, amongst other things, for terrorism and hate crime, anti-Nazi crime and um, terror threats. So you had a killing that taken place where a secret service agent was inside and until now, this is the one killing where all, all other killing have been resolved where uh, no one knows why the person was there. In fact, in subsequent criminal trials of the one surviving member of the NSU, that person, Andreas Temme, has been believed by the court and by the police. He is considered no longer to be a suspect. He, his testimony that he was there by chance at the time of the killing, he was there for about 10 minutes, and during that 10 minutes that killing took place, he said he was there to check some dating sites or something like that. That is, being, that is believed now, that's the official version by the German court and the German police. We thought we will intensify our analytic gaze on that working together 
with uh, the witnesses, the father of the deceased, uh, Ismail Yozgat is his name, and others, together with all the evidence that we could, we, we could achieve, in order to open up, to force the German Secret Service to call that person to testify, um, and for the, for the record of the Internal Security Service, the Verfassungsschutz, uh, to be open in relation to this case. So what we were looking for is not a killing. The killing that takes place there is the backdrop to another investigation that is to do with the cover-up of the involvement, potential involvement, of the secret services uh, in there. Um, the investigation was made possible, really, um, by the discovery of uh, something uh, very unique, uh, and that is, um, let me just get there. Where is it? And that is that um, <clears throat> in 2015, a neo another neo-Nazi group has been able to go into the police. Um, oh, I'm really trying to do something I cannot do right now. Um, has been um, hacked or got delivered the entire police investigation of that killing uh, were leaked to this Nazi group who immediately put it online. So in 2015, the beginning of 2015, the entire police investigation was all of the sudden available. So taking the police investigation, documents upon documents of interrogations of witnesses, documents upon documents of police reports, and something that is very unique that allowed the entire process to take place, the login and log outs of each one of the witnesses in that case. So when you kill somebody in the internet cafe, you need to understand that this is not like any other place. Every witness is logged in. Every witness is either on a computer or on a phone. So you have uh, about five people in a shop where the killing take place, and all of them, we have the the time. This is the in in the in a police investigation, the time when each one uh, has logged in and logged out, and in fact, this is what uh, allowed us to locate each one of the witnesses. Now within a model, uh, you would see we've built both a physical and a digital model, and we were able to create a matrix. Uh, both a time-space matrix in which now the memories of the witnesses could be assessed and could be actually located. So here is um, the reconstruction, kind of the slow reconstruction, simply of the setup. Like in a theater play, the actors kind of walk in. So Ahmed walks in just after 4.30. Um, this is finally the, the, uh, the victim. He goes into PC7, and we have the exact time when he's logging in at 16.46. He logs in and switches on a computer game called Call of Duty in which the aim is to shoot Nazis, right? So, And he would be logged in to this game. He'll be shooting Nazis digitally while a Nazi would come and kill his friend. In, in, a, in a physical world. Uh, the second witness comes in, etc., etc., and you, you, you have now um, a situation if the, that in which we can slowly build the timeline of the witnesses coming in. Here is now the Secret Service agent, the last one to come in uh, to, the com to a computer, uh, and we have the precise login time to uh, his uh, dating site. This is the dating site he's actually using. I love dot de, uh, and also his logout time. Okay, so we have a space-time matrix into which um, now the witness memories, which are always um, very precise in relation to 
uh, sequences and sometimes distorted in relation to duration can now fit uh, within. Now, the last person that actually enters the, uh, the shop, Fize, uh, is actually using a telephone. Now, the telephone logs are different than internet logs. The computer, the, the, the phone company gives you the, end, the beginning time of a conversation, of a phone conversation within a minute resolution and the end time within a second resolution. So you don't know within that minute, we know he's made two phone calls. We know at the time he went into the booth, Halit Yozgat, the victim, was alive. At the time that he exited the booth, Halit Yozgat is dead. These are nine and a half minutes within 77 square meters. And the idea is really, if we can shed some light of what happened in the kind of the, within the architect, time space, this architecture, of the relationship between the state, a victim, and the killers, uh, we can open up questions that would crack out and lead out from this small shop to the scale of uh, Germany, in <laughs> fact, because other questions will have to be asked. Why is the court accepting that testimony? Why is the police not investigating? Where are the files of the Verfassungsschutz of the internal service? Why is the media letting it go? Etc. 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 Right. The entire kind of institutional racism would 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 um, we were hoping we are still hoping to be unravelled by uh, taking that black hole, right, this dark hole of, of space time, and um, and asking questions about it again. Our aim is not to say what happened. Our aim in this investigation is to show that the Secret Service agent story of the event is false, that he's lying, right? And uh, one of the very important, um, so now we are uh, uh, basically starting to reenact the scenarios that um, I will not really uh, go through it uh, in much detail. I'd let it play here in the background. Um, we had a very... Uh, we will. I hope we will see it at some point. We'll have a very rare thing that was leaked inside that leak, and that is that Secret Service agent himself. You know what? Maybe it's worth actually. Yes, looking for it. Oh, by chance I saw it. So this is the police reenactment. This is Andreas Temer. This is the Verfassungsschutz agent, and he's undertaking for the police three weeks after the killing a reenactment of what has taken place, right? He's walking through the shop. In fact, that shop does not exist. We have to build that shop later simply from material in this video, right? Because it's the last documentation of this shop. He's moving through the shop. Now, this video for us, you've seen the exhibition upstairs, I think, and you saw that we analyze videos of alleged crime, whether it's environmental crime or it is shooting, bombing in different places in the world. For us, that video is the crime. This is not a representation of the crime. That is now, for us, the crime of perjury, perjury enacted one-to-one. -one. Because what is reenactment? Is the body's is the testimony of the body, right? You walk. This is you say. This is your story, right? That is just physically enacted, and so here. We're not using it in order to see what happened, but the entire investigation is here to, to reenact the reenactment, to represent the representation. Because this is, oh, here, here, for example, what you see here uh, is the entire dump, you no, know, the kind of the, the, the neo Nazi dump. Now, you ask, why would the neo Nazis put it online? Because, frankly, here in this case, strangely, both the left. And the communities that we are working for, and the extreme right, perhaps disturbingly, share similar interests. The extreme right Nazis want to say, it's not us, it's the state. It's the Verfassungsschutz that made us do it. The extreme left say, well, there's institutional racism in Germany, which we need to you know, basically point our mind to. There are Nazis inside the, the police and the, and, the, and the secret services. Uh, and to, to, in a strange way, uh, both are, uh, but as I show you later, in also with very different implication, 
at, uh, at focusing their attention on the police. So, um, again, this is an interrogation of a representation, of a reenactment, and whether the reenactment is truthful. Because if the reenactment is not truthful, many, many, many implications uh, would come out of it. So here is, is, is where you would see, um, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the thing is online and you, could, uh, you, you can watch it more slowly. Uh, we've built a model of the shop and we have built a, a 3D one-to-one -one model of it as well. Why we build it both digitally and physically? Because of something that Hannah already mentioned to ground truth. Ground truth is a way in which um, the a physical reality and digital reality need to anchor each other. Now you would say digital reality <laughs> is a representation that needs to be anchored, calibrated to something physical so that we know, I don't know, if that green is green on the image and this green is a little bit blue on the ground, we need to recalibrate the entire color spectrum. That's ground truth in a classical sense, probably the other way around. A little bit blue on the image, a little bit green on the ground needs to be recalibrated. Now, both of, but what, both of what we have are representation. So what you calibrate to what? They need to be both calibrated to each other, at least to see that those two analog and physical representation of a representation, which is the reenactment, are able to sync up, right? So the thing would hold it has no base. There is no base in so so called the real world. You have three representations, but if they link up, you increase the probability of them describing uh, a truthful uh, situation. So here, what you have is is a kind of a very wild abstraction of the shop. We've built very in great detail the division wall between the computer room and the phone room that was crossed during the time of the murder. Uh, and um, we've built it in great detail, and we destroyed it after three days. We just simply use it as a film studio, as a smell studio, and as an audio studio, as, as I would show you, and in order to ground the computer model. So here is the, um, uh, the location, and now... So within that, we basically, with actors, we undertake uh, a number of uh, reenactment. This is what you see. There's like three scenarios, and we basically work by elimination and the idea of diminishing probability. We basically um, de de effectively eliminate the possibility that he is telling the truth by undertaking again and again and again for about three days actors perform again and again and again the sequence of action that needed to have taken place for Tamer to tell the truth. So we are like his lawyer. So we say, okay, for him to tell the truth, and his story was that. His story, he's sitting at the back room. The killing is taking place here, at the front room on the desk. This is the front door. He says that he did not hear any shots in the front room. The shots were with a silencer. Okay, so the shot through the silence. He don't, didn't hear them. Then, after not hearing them, he simply ended his surfing session, went to the front room, looked for Halit Yozgat in order to pay, could not find him, and left uh, to uh, to his car and has driven off. So, okay, that's fine. Let's now reenact what would need to happen. Okay, so if he's telling the truth. He would not have heard. Maybe it was too too silent. Then he would need to, um, or either he hasn't heard because it's too silent, or the shot have not yet. Halit is still alive, right? So he he goes out. Uh, Halit is actually by chance outside the shop while he's looking for him. Uh, he's is leaving a coin on a table and he's leaving the shop. After he's leaving, Halit enters, sit on his chair. A killer comes in, shoot him, and Faiz is leaving the thing. We have exactly the, the time in which everything needs to take place. And um, we, we are really trying very hard to show it would have been possible. Here you'd see Halit in red, <coughs> an actor representing him walking in. Um, the, uh, 
the error is, is basically mirroring it within the digital model. Uh, the killer is now coming in in the white error. This is the killer coming in, shooting twice, shooting once, shooting twice, and exiting very fast. And then uh, fires immediately coming out of the shop. And not, none of these actors could see each other, right? Temme needs to go out without seeing Halit. Um, the, um, and Faiz should not see the killer that has taken place. Uh, and then we show there's very little time in order to do it. Is that green on the, or just, oh. Uh, okay. So without going into it, I will just tell you that this is, this is impossible. Um, and uh, then we are starting to go deeper into the codes into what the witnesses have seen, comparing memory and the distortion of memory, something that Matt and I could, to, could talk later in relation to code, time-space codes uh, within that. Uh, again, narrowing the time of the murder, the possible time of the mer murder now, to 60 seconds. Why? Because the, the, the resolution of the beginning of the call is, as I said, 60 seconds. So the imprecision of the signal um, uh, does not allow us to get uh, higher uh, resolution, time space resolution than that. So, this within that minute, we know for sure by analyzing the testimonies and the logs that the killing took place between 1701 and 1702. The logout time until that point, Teme is sitting by his desk. There's 20 seconds in which uh, he could have gone into the front of the shop after logging out, and there's 40 seconds in which he could have sat at the back of the shop. If he was, if the killing took place after he logged out, it's the Secret Service agent that was directly involved in the killing, because he is in the space-time of the killing in the front of the shop. If that, if it happened before, he would have been a witness. Now, what is witnessing? Now, we think, uh, often, we conceived of the notion of witness as uh, something, somebody has seen something. But witnessing is um, very, you know, very simple definition of it by law is a sensory contact with an event, right? Yeah, you could have smelled it, you could have heard it, you could have seen it. So that is called ear witness, if you've heard it, or, sm or nose witness, if you smelled it. Believe it, yeah. There could be even mouth witness if you've tasted it. Uh, or if you are not, not able to see and, and it's all tactile, that could be also. Uh, so a sensory contact in a, in a, with an event make you a witness. If you heard about somebody else having a sensory contact, this is hearsay, right? So you need a direct sensory contact. So what are the senses? How are we, are we to define the threshold of audibility? Could he hear, have heard the shot? How we are to define the threshold of smellability. Um, the, the whole question was, in, uh, in this police interrogation, how come he has not smelled the gunpowder? There's an enormously sharp smell when you shoot a gun in a closed room of the gunpowder lingers in the air. So we needed to basically turn that models into sensorium, into a kind of, if you like, a sort of an aesthetic, um, in a sort of traditional way of aesthetics, one that Matt and I will discuss, i.e. a kind of a sense, a, a hyper, uh, hyperesthesia, you know, the kind of the hyper aesthetics of, of, of matter, um, in order to see whether Teme would have been uh, able to, to undertake that. So let's, let's just jump directly to uh, these scenarios. I mean, the, I really urge you to, uh, to look at it in detail because it's, um, so you know that in Arizona, you um, you know basically you, you can shoot um, guns easily, um, and we have called a uh, you know a gun expert in Arizona we t to source the same gun and to shoot it uh, and to take the sound of it. Of course, um, although we found the same gun, we didn't find a silencer for that gun. We found a silencer also for only for other guns. So we had to shoot now three guns say that the same sound level shot freely, it's, uh, it's basically the same in, with very, very tiny variation. 
and then put the silencer on uh, one of the one of the guns, the Colt gun uh, that he could find, and then we could record a silence shot again another level of translation and you would see that in this investigation you'd have a lot of parallel you know like you you cannot proceed with that gun you compare that gun to another gun that other gun represent that gun just think about all the levels of representation on representation on representation that happened here and the way in which digital memory and physical space anchor each other in, an, in, in a cycle of representation that spins almost out of control. We are now in a sort of, you know, seventh remove representation, right, from, uh, from the event, but still moving very carefully in choosing uh, our options in that way. So here, these are the shots. None of the gunshots. Wow. So none of the gunshots uh, go over 130 decibels. Basically, we source a speaker f that is used otherwise. That is the speaker. We put it exactly in the model where the killer has been. That speaker is a very high decibel speaker. Uh, luckily, Berlin, where we built that one-to-one uh, -one investigation, is known for very good nightclubs that have excellent, powerful speakers. And, um, and, and you need the special kind of like, you know, I don't have a technical name for it right now, but like the sort of high frequency, high decibel uh, speakers that um, required for that. Um, and we, so we've located that and then uh, measured the sound level uh, on the uh, other part of the room. Now, measurement end. Measurement two, gunshot. Start now. <laughs> Measurement end. Okay, so, um, and then basically we need to, uh, again, I, I just, oh, how did we get here? Um, all right. Uh, and then we had to do here, this, this is something, I'll, I'll just freeze on that for a second. Um, we had to, basically anchor now the sound again within a digital model of the room that was given our acoustic properties and within a digital model of the physical model right because we needed to see we have the the, the measurement from the physical model not from the room so we had to see what's the difference between another set of representation of representation right we needed to model the the the, the the physical room with acoustic, uh, sorry, the physical installation, which is a model of that model, which is a model of that, right? What uh, what happened in the shop in which the reenactment has taken place, um, and um, and undertaken basically both both of those um, have been revealed to uh, would have been clearly heard at the position of Andreas Temme over here. So so we took out sound. So basically we say. He could not have been outside the shop. He could only have been inside the shop. And if he would be inside the shop in the front, he's the killer. If he would be in the inside of the shop in the back, he definitely would have heard um, the, the, uh, the gunshot. Here now is the smell experiment. Again, I'll go on it very, very uh, fast. Um, this was actually not fully conclusive because the patent over what goes into gunpowder and whether mm -hmm. there's sulfur in the gunpowder or not. Uh, we suspect there is sulfur in this gunpowder, but the, the, we contacted the company that produces that and we didn't get the exact chemical composition because it's a patent, it's a secret. Uh, so we, we could just basically undertake um, this smell experiment for uh, ammonia, which we know exists in the gunpowder and how it would behave uh, in space and time. Uh, basically, the threshold, we, we calibrated that cloud to show us only, and the lighter blue, is when things begin to be smellable on average, right? So uh, this is the threshold of smell, and the, the red is in high intensity, and that's the kind of the movement of uh, the smell in the room when different things happen. When he enters, now you'd see uh, the door opening, 
Oh, you would not see that. Maybe it was before. Um, so that that is basically just the kind of the modeling of the smell in the room, and then the same thing we cut it to the nose level effectively uh, of Teme, calculating his height. So that's a kind of like a section cut uh, cut in that way, and. Um, you see, when the door opens, uh, you know, this, obviously the entire kind of dynamics, fluid dynamics is, is transforming uh, within the room. Okay, so, and then vision, uh, we needed to show that he would have seen the body if Yozgat was already dead. So what we've done, we used motion detectors on his face and uh, then kind of you know, also modeled it in, in different ways. And basically what you see here is Teme walking, that's the reenactment, and this is what he's seeing while he's walking. That's his kind of cone of vision. So whenever he stands or, or shifts his head, uh, he would have seen something else. Um, and we wanted to see if the body would have been visible to him according to the testimony we've interviewed, the father who located the body uh, in this precise position behind the table. Uh, so he's looking for Yozgat. He's saying he cannot find him. He's going back. He's going front. Again, we don't know if this reenactment described the, 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 the real situation. In fact, we suspect it's a lie anyway, but we need this is exactly the crime that we need to describe. And then here, the body would have been clearly visible uh, to him. And then, you know, there's basically the kind of... Um, sort of a set of conclusion and a set of animation that kind of show how we have arrived for a combination of various things. Uh, leak documents, uh, memory of witnesses, logins and logouts uh, of, uh, of the people, representation, representation of representation, representation, of representation etc. Uh, from which we have deduced in, and we put, we effectively put our entire reputation on the line here, that this uh, that Andreas Temer is not telling the truth. Uh, and so that um, when when we presented it for the first time, um, the court that judges uh, the involvement of, of one of the members of the NSU uh, wanted to invite us to um, to testify uh, in the court because that would have effectively opened up transformed the, whole, the, the dynamics of the or could help transform the dynamic of the discussion and bring the fasting shoots under pressure, then something happened, um, technical and uh, on which the, the legal aspect is not very clearly explained, uh, in which uh, we have received an email that effectively gave us information with which, which meant that we got disqualified from court. So the entire uh, process is now basically on hold. And, some people are happy uh, about that. But, um, I mean, this this kind of end sequence is kind of like basically a superimposition of all the models and all the actors reenacting the reenactor in a model space of a model space, et cetera, et cetera. And the, uh, the questions that come out of it in which the shots that Andreas Temer has heard, or should have heard, that was silenced, that were accepted as silenced uh, by the court, are silenced now also juridically. Um, and uh, in fact, that kind of one murder of Halit Yozgat um, is still not resolved within this frame of nine minutes, 77 square meter. But the entire NSU complex that is built around it is still standing also. Um, Okay, so this is kind of like an opener for mm. our conversation, and um, from which we can. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that we discussed, we we discussed this discussion before, as you know, everything has to have layers of interpretation upon layers of interpretation. So our discussion we've discussed, and now we'll discuss what we've discussed in our discussions about the discussion. <laughs> um, and one of the. One of the kind of key questions is to think about this term investigative aesthetics and whether it's, uh, it just sounds good or whether it has um, some real kind of traction on the kind of questions 
that forensic architecture and others uh, are dealing with. Um, and I think there's a there's some things that we can think about in terms of what is investigation, uh, what 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 does it mean as a form of practice, as a form of intellectual inquiry, but also as a form uh, that brings up a somewhat uh, discredited notion, uh, which is the truth, and how this in turn uh, becomes uh, aesthetic. And I think one of the things that, uh, listening to Ayal speaking uh, just now, there's a number of ways in which um, investigation can be interrogated. And I think one of the one of the ways um, is to think about it as an organisational form. So each different kind of investigation has its own uh, institution, its own uh, form of expression in 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 social and institutional terms. And if we think of the the idea of the investigation as uh, something that's worked through in literature, the classic. Uh, agent of the investigation is the detective and the detective is always slightly uh, askance at an angle from uh, society. It's the, uh, the detective is always a malcontent, there's always something wrong with them, kind of like an artist uh, in some way. Um, <laughs> the detective is always against the police and so the, the police are always uh, have a different kind of power. Uh, the detective is not necessarily uh, not a police operative, but is always at a tangent to them. The police are always a bureaucratic form of knowledge. They're a form of state knowledge, a form of molar acquisition of facts. And the, the, the way in which the police uh, mass-produce facts, mass-produce testimonies and so on, allows the detective to stand out as someone that is almost like a kind of neurosurgeon uh, finding the stray synapses in the brain of the city and knitting them together. And this is, this is what makes the detective novel uh, both something about uh, the subjectivity of the, the detective but also the subjectivity of the city as an, as an organism. And I think that's, that's something that really brings out the, the question of investigation as an organizational form every kind of investigation has its own idealized or actual investigator and here with this uh, Verfassungsschutz um, case we have this um, involution of the position of the investigator as the investigator as criminal and this is a new uh, well not entirely new form let's say but it's uh, an, a new variation on an old theme but what I think forensic architecture perhaps proposing uh, is the architectural studio as an institutional or organisational form, something between the bureaucracy of the police and the individual idiosyncratic work of uh, the detective. Uh, enables a form of collective work, uh, but that also the collective work is based around forms of creativity, forms of intuition, forms of different kinds of rigour uh, and disciplinary formation. So that's investigation understood as an organisational form, but we can also see it as something that is prof profoundly about forms of knowledge, so it's an epistemological form as well. And here it's something formed at the junction between uh, the sciences and the humanities. I think this is something very characteristic of the era that we're now calling, in some, some debates, the post-humanities. Uh, so we've had, uh, in the, the brilliant discussions earlier, the question of the non-human. Uh, and this, the question of how, uh, in, the, in, in Hannah, and Susan's, uh, Su Hannah and Susan's discussions, uh, there was this presentation of how non-human agents, non-human agency, can generate forms of witnessing. But there's also the question of how human forms uh, of knowledge deal with this post-human condition. And we can go back through 
this modality, different modalities of epistemology to think this through. And one of the one of the interesting uh, characters to think this through with is uh, Carlo Ginzburg, the Italian historian, who works on the question of microhistory. And although he has a different uh, intellectual genealogy, I think the, the question of microhistory is very much tends in certain ways to the way in which um, forensic architecture's work uh, brings together different questions of scale. So the microscopic, the question of the molecule, the question of the, the, the silver halide crystal, the question of the ammonia, the ammonia molecule, and the question of, of satellite images. So this, this question of the micro to macro transitions in history that, that Ginsburg uh, emphasizes by looking at, for instance, the, the daily life of um, people in the medieval period, for instance, or the way in which clues to the authorship of paintings can be found best in the way that the, the nails are painted or the earlobes are painted, the minor parts of a painting that uh, give us better clues to the, the authorship of a painting. But I think this, this question of epistemology also brings up the question about um, the way in which models of knowledge of interpretation, which is always bound up, interpretation is always bound up with investigation, also ties into uh, the question of what kind of intelligence is being addressed by investigation. And here there's also an interesting crossover with the humanities and formal intelligence agencies, if we're to imagine the agencies such as the FBI and CIA uh, correspond to that term. So William Empson, the 20th century literary critic who wrote the book Seven Types of Ambiguity, an early um, mm -hmm. discussion of modernist literature, his book, The Seven Types of Ambiguity, is quite a short book which has its advantages, um, was actually taken as a manual for interpretation of documents and encoded inscriptions by the early um, American intelligence organizations. So this was a formalist reading of modernist literature which taught its readers how to engage with multiplicities of meaning. But it became a fundamental teaching tool for uh, early, 20, early and mid 20th century um, intelligence agencies. So there's a sense in which the questions of power are also, I mean, as we know from Foucault and others, are always questions um, also of knowledge. How formulations or figurations of interpretation, has, how uh, structures that allow hermeneutic access to truth or figurations of the truth uh, are also questions of techniques and precisely about techniques and technologies of interpretation, there are also questions of the exercise of power. And the last uh, figure I want to think about in terms of what investigation means is um, Sherlock Holmes. The qu one of the processes um, that Al just mentioned is this phrase, uh, the analytic gaze. And we, we know um, the idea of the gaze from film theory, Laura Mulvey's work and, and so on, um, describing the way in which human subjects or subjects of other kinds look or regard the world um, as being something that is implicitly political, that it has an erotics, that it has a power associated with it. And... There is something in the construction of an analytical gaze that I think uh, has a, a correspondence to this, uh, this kind of theoretical structure. And one of the interesting things that uh, the fictional detective Sherlock Holmes brings about is a popular understanding of the scientific method uh, and the method of analysis, which is... Um, approximately to be stated as when all possible candidate facts are assembled, you remove what cannot be true, what remains must be the truth. And we see this adopted um, 
in a cultural practice in the in the work that Al has just presented, uh, but it's something that is commonly adopted only by scientists. So we see there's a movement from one discipline, one discipline, um, a, a movement of a method, the method of analysis from one one discipline, one set of disciplines, to another. And I think this marks, and it's one of the things that marks. Um, the shift to a post-human techniques in certain ways, but it also marks a fundamental shift in uh, the way in which epistemologies move nowadays, and epistemologies move partly as technical practices, and this the imaginary associated and the aesthetics associated with particular technical practices uh, is what marks out our abilities to mobilize these practices also in political terms. So I'm trying to think, you know, what are the ways um, that this, the investigation, I'm interested in AL's account of how investigation has changed over the course of forensic architecture's practice. Because if you, if you go upstairs and look at the exhibition, the mode of, ex of investigation is quite different in each project, and this, as well as the stakes, and the, the methods are also different, but there's, there is this fundamental commitment uh, to analysis and fundamental commitment to a certain repertoire of vocabulary of representation. So I'm interested, what, what, is, what has changed in investigation over the course of the, the, the forensic architecture's life? Well, the, I mean, the, there is that, and there is there's everything else that you've said that that um, is somehow I kind of almost feel like I I want to go through your point and kind of like mm. start again with them and in that way arrive at at the uh, at the end question where, mm. where you passed it on. So you started. I think what what was incredibly interesting uh, for me is the kind of the detective versus the police uh, analogy and the sort of like the nosy detective no mm -hmm. <laughs> the cut nose or uh, and the the idea that if the police would always operate through the management of archives through the collection of, of hoovering of enormous mm. amount of information, right? It is the population that needs to be actually monitored, right? They're both biopolitically and, you know, in terms of the ideas that, that are around, no? The archive become uh, the mode of operation. <coughs> the detective is somehow a kind of... Um, anti-archival process mm. no and that is what so what 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 happened in the kind of in the in the difference because the you know the detective would not have all earlobes and all fingerprints and all skull shapes and all mm -hmm. um profile on what you've shopped uh you know on your credit card available to them so there's something else that need to be mobilized no so you called it intuition mm. And um, but perhaps that is the kind of the opening towards the aesthetics, right? So there is, what is the kind of the intuition meaning, a result that is arrived beyond calculus, let's say, um, a thought beyond calculation, right? A, a thought that is not to do with um, a, ma a mathematical measuring of probabilities and potentialities, etc. But a sort of a hunch, mm -hmm. right? Um, is is not dissimilar to what you know even very traditionally we understand as aesthetic practices uh, is something that escapes the analytics right so what is that which escapes and how to mobilize that which escapes against the archival process so there is in the archival process itself and and um because the the, the police would always have, by definition, two interests, right? There's the interest of that particular crime, and there is the common good, right? The general good that sometimes trumps the telling the truth about particular cases. And the idea of the common good is a very political idea, right? So let's mm -hmm. say the Verfassungsschutz 
let's assume they're not a terror organization that, that, that wants to uh, intentionally target and kill migrant uh, people from, from different places. But they have some sort of political control they want to kind of balance out between their informers and in society, and they want to kind of like keep the common good. That idea of controlling the archives, right, it has, gives you the sort of a perspective that is very different than the interest of a particular investigation. And in, it's in the mm -hmm. balance between those two things and in the highly politicized and uh, idea of the common good, an idea that very quickly just basically degenerate or deteriorate or shifts toward terrorism, right? Because the common good, the idea of the common good would be the idea of crushing all dissidents, right? That this is a crime, but it's a necessary crime. And for doing that necessary crime for the common good, the police that is both having the, fo the picture of the common good and the epistemology of particular investigation has is effectively there's there's a massive contradiction between them because they'll have to create say disappearance in order to keep or, or to to disappear the evidence about disappearance mm -hmm. in order for the common good to be maintained by their political by a particular political rationality right so uh, no, I'm just looking at Cesar and kind of thinking about Guatemala no and that that idea of the internal services, uh, of the police, of the paramilitaries, supposedly operating as a kind of a cleaning yes. oper operation. And producing disappearances that are in fact not only the disappearance of people, but the act of disappearance is an epistemological act. It's an act on the evidence that disappearance has taken place. So disappearance is not simply putting people in a mass grave or throwing them into the Pacific or whatever else you do in order to get rid of the body, but destroying the evidence of the airplane having taken place, of petrol for this airplane having been bought, for whatever else, uh, for the presence of people from the Navy or from the military presence uh, in, in, in that particular base, etc. The act of disappearance become a political and start kind of like mm -hmm. completely contaminate the, the, the entire social political field. And this is why and this is why the detective versus the police is very important because mm -hmm. if you open the mode, if you show it in one in one point, you show it doesn't work. You show the gaps between the one epistemic project and the other, uh, you are able to effectively destabilize it. So, so there is a thought in which investigation is simply a kind of post factum thing. No, I mean, something, and now mm -hmm. it's for closure and it's for, you know, coming to term, which is all very true. And, and you know, we, we, we are trembling within, whenever we are in touch with parents or any, anyone that has lost a dear one uh, and, and, and seek that closure. It's extremely important. But to think that disappearance or terror in Germany against migrant community is in fact a terrorist project that, um, that is to say this is not simply something of the past, right? Yeah. It's not simply, it's, it's, it's a political intervention in, in, in that relations of knowledge of, of the fact of policing. So, you know, and then, and then I'm kind of interested in your work on counter forensics, and mm. we can we can get to that later, in which um, those forms of uh, we are operating in which in a field in which knowledge and information becoming ever more different, or there's variation in that politics as modes of control. So you know, we're talking about the biopolitical project, about the mm. state archive. Now we can speak about you know, predictive algorithms and intersection of different knowledge as modes of government. We need to understand that that knowledge power relation takes ever new forms as different forms of government in which 
the police is the very agent that simultaneously, again, needs to keep the common good and undertake the investigation. That mm. doesn't work. That that is the the thing that here the detective need to enter and operate from a non-archival mm. kind of perspective, and hence come the the kind of the idea of aesthetic. So you know, and then and then and then you ask like, what what are the level of aesthetics that uh, that are in in operation here. So here we have various material and non-material uh, aesthetic practices, some to do with judgment and some to do with the sensorium, right? Aesthetics is to smell, right? Your nose is aestheticized to ammonia. That's, that's the meaning of aesthetics. As much as it could be anesthetized if you are undertaking some operation and they don't want you to feel something. Uh, so that's that's aesthetics. It's it's looking at the material witness in Susan's term, right, mm. as a sensorium, right. The material witness senses the world. The sensorium is the way in which, uh, in this investigation, this particular investigation, the aesthetics, is how a cloud of ammonia, a testimony, a code log, and memory relate to each other, mm. right. They sense each other. They relate to each other. They are completely incompatible things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but they are mashed together through the incident and and analyzed aesthetically uh, in that form. So there's something in that aesthetic dimension. And then we say, what happens? And this is, I think, something that you've asked when the lab turns into the studio. What what's the difference between a lab and a studio as a truth production? device right what 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 is um what happens in what kind of decisions what kind of protocols and i don't think there's a there's a single decision i could say oh you know the lab but we need to look at the practices of production of an experiment a scientific experiment or you know an architectural analysis or you know an, an artistic or filmic investigation uh, that you that you take place there's various protocols of um, of combining those sensoriums of aesthetics that operates across the spectrum from the aesthetics of matter i.e you know how one material senses the presence of another material how a water molecule or i don't know susan you correct me senses the radioactivity and contain it is aestheticized to radioactivity and then you start moving through the pacific right but it's aestheticized this material aesthetics to the way Aesthetics is employed in a studio as a truth production machine, effectively, and how then later you present it, and how the presentation of that enters into a kind of an aesthetic understanding of politic political relations. Mm -hmm. uh, so, what 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 does it mean? In this investigation, we had to be on the ammonia particle and on thinking about race relations in Germany simultaneously, and they are related. The ammonia molecule and race relation in Germany are, are, are brought together in, in this thing, not in representational way, but in the direct material material uh, way. And, and both through, stink, right? Sorry? Because both stink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On to you. Um, I guess, I mean, the, the, a term aside from the the police and the, and the, the detectives that you brought up was the term of population, and what are the, one of the things that's been brought out in this uh, these sessions today has been a kind of expansion of the term of, of population, in terms of thinking of plants uh, of what counts as nature as being part of population, but there's also I think um, something else. Uh, that allows population, the concept of population, to mutate uh, in certain ways. And so if, if the population is the thing that's archived, it's monitored, it's surveyed, it's recorded, uh, it's also, as the investigation becomes active, the population uh, is also able to become active in different ways. And it becomes active in very particular ways according to investigations. And you've, you know, you've mentioned this tribunal uh, that's being set up in Germany um, but there's also this development of um, practices of open source intelligence that work via gathering uh, material in the public domain, in social media, things that are leaked, uh, official documents that are, are 
gained access to through freedom of information measures and so on. So there's a, there's a way in which populations in different or people that are rendered or people, agencies, structures and processes that are normally rendered simply as populations uh, also become active in different ways in this, um, in this mode of investigation. And there are different forms that people are developing for this. And I just wondered if you um, could say something about the way in which investigation more generally, not simply in forensic architecture, but in terms of investigative journalism, uh, in open source intelligence, uh, is also changing in the present. What is the, what is the stakes and what are the modalities uh, of these changes in, in intelligence and investigation? Yeah. No, I mean, this is, I, I think there's, there's um, we, we can think generally on kind of two modes of investigative journalism, you know, and this is pretty much how investigative mm. journalism itself uh, present it. Of course, you know, the minute you present it, you'd say there's, you know, the border is not that clear, etc. But mm. let's, let's say, let, let, let's divide it to exposing information that is not in a public domain, i.e. it's government secret uh, it is out there. There is there is a kind of a border between the known and the unknown that need to be broken. No, and it needs to be broken through leaks, for example, or through hacking into it, or through having some agent inside who tells you things, source, mm. uh, or you know whatever else you can you can you can uh, undertake in order to do that. The second model, and, and then we'll talk about how they're connected, mm. is the model of the open source investigation that is to say all the symptoms are out there in fact in fact there's very little that matters that is in that kind of under the firewall that nobody knows all the stuff is out there but we need to develop new ways of looking mm -hmm. right so then you have investigative journalists like Elliot Higgins a very close friend of us and collaborator in the who kind of, you know, sort of the father, although he's very young, of open source mm -hmm. uh, investigations. And he basically says, well, you know, I mean, there's all this stuff out there, but nobody's looking at it. We don't know how to look at it. You know, because you're looking in an old fashioned sort of way. You're just looking at the video. This is the last thing you need to do. You mm -hmm. need to look at the relationship between videos. You need to look at the time space relationship between them. You need to see. Um, so, so basically, you know, he became very well known when he kind of effectively cross-referenced some several dozens of uh, clips he found in YouTube in various places in, in the Ukraine mm -hmm. uh, about it. In one, you'd see the, the kind of the rocket launcher that finally ended up shooting down the Malaysian airplane uh, over uh, Indonesia, showing that this was a Russian uh, uh, battery of anti-aircraft mm -hmm. that, that actually crossed the border. Uh, to the Ukraine, from from uh, from Russia to the Ukraine, uh, etc. So that that is to say, the world is out. The thing are out there, the work is seeing. The other thing is to say no, or, or not no. In addition, mm -hmm. the thing is that simply not seen. The act is to make the unseen seen. But the if the open source journalist said no. The minute you made it seen, it's not yet seen. We need to develop a way of seeing this. This is nothing. The dumping, the the, the, the leak part of the WikiLeak is, mm. is easy. You know, you make an automat, you, you can make it in a software. Who needs WikiLeak? You just have a box that anonymizes from wherever you send it. And after, you know, 24 hours, poof, it kind of makes itself public on a website and sends tweets to everybody that it's out. Well, who needs mm. Julian Assange in the, uh, in the Ecuadorian uh uh, Colombian border, no, I mean, well, he could. Uh, he's, it's not necessary for that. The wiki part is the the, the kind of the mm. open source part, right? That, that was not very good. Uh, it didn't quite work in in that. So, so the 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 question is now, what is the relationship between the visible and the invisible? So you have like stuff that is hidden, but its symptoms are all over the place. Its contours are all over the place. Okay, there's a body in the ground, but there's loads of flies over. Or there's body in the ground, but there's a lot of special kind of grass that is over the ground that is seen. That you need to understand what it is to 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 break that border between visible and invisible. I.e., that that is 
uh, maybe one of the uh, ideas uh, of, of what we do. And, and this is um, now the kind of, um, we realize that for counter forensics, the open source of it is a great advantage. In fact, this was thrown out of the German court mm. For, you know, I mean, of course, there's a lot of interest and political interest of how they mobilized that bit, but a bit of, you know, the email, the content of the email that we were sent crossed that border between the public and the non-public. That was material that was not in the public domain. The minute it arrived into our hard drives, even though we have not consulted it at all, was a great way to, like, puncture the entire investigation. This is built only on open source um, material mm. but then again you'd say the open source is a leak right so there's there is that um uh sort of relation but i don't know if that is, is mm. what you meant mm. yeah i think one of the other questions that i think is a, is a big question uh related to the question of investigative journalism is why this kind of work is appearing in an institution like documenta or macba um what has happened to the context of investigation more broadly? Where does the agency of investigation uh, lie nowadays? What has happened also uh, to the field of art, to the field of architecture, um, and to the speed of the museum uh, as, a, as a space uh, that allows questions of contemporary investigation uh, and remembering that, as you say, the investigation is something that occurs in real time as well as in the, the longer time of the archive. What has happened to these institutions? Um, and I think there's, you know, there's a number of ways which we can see that something has changed about uh, cultural practices. So cultural practices, specifically art and to some extent architecture, are able to work as meta disciplines, so they're able. There are disciplines that are able to work on the um, on the form of knowledge of other disciplines, such as uh, politics, uh, the sciences, and so on. So, in the same way that that philosophy has always claimed to be able to um, evaluate the the conditions of truth of other disciplines. Art is now able to evaluate the conditions of percep perception, sensation, and epistemology of other disciplines, and art broadly speaking. So art changes the stakes of what it is. It changes uh, its ability to, to work simply on sensation, perception, experience. Um, claims more than mere intuition uh, and moves into... Uh, being able to work with systematic forms of knowledge that are able to integrate uh, or um, act corrosively on other forms of knowledge. And there's something extraordinary about that uh, as a transition. But there's also something quite interesting about the the move in the the operation of the, the art institution or the museum. So what is the role of the museum when it presents uh, investigative practices? And I think you know, this is something that also uh, moves across into the question of what, is the, what are the institutions that are appropriate for training and educating uh, and, and developing in, in terms of research uh, this kind of work? So how does it spread beyond um, uh, the kinds of agencies that are already working with it? How does it become uh, more systematic? Mm -hmm. So two levels of question in a sense, so, or yeah. three. What has happened to art? What has happened to the museum and to the gallery? And then what happens? What has happened to the, um, the kind of institutions in which um, training the genesis of, of new generations practice uh, also emerges and is established? Mm. That's, that's um, we need to think about it, and I'll kind of like just try to. <laughs> but uh, first of all, I think that um, whereas uh, you know documentary forms, uh, 
forms of political critique, forms of institutional critique are kind of at home now, mm. perhaps too much at home, uh, in museums. Uh, investigative practices kind of sit uncomfortably. Mm. A- as you said, simply because um, the natural allergy, let's say, that uh, the museum has to the notion of truth, because it was conceived as the other temple, right? As the temple of truth, science, as the temple of art, which is beauty, and then later mutated, beauty became critique to a certain extent. No? Um, this is a shortcut. But, but um, in, in a sense, truth can only enter a museum as a target, never as, an, uh, you know, as a target to critique, mm-hmm. right? Here's a truth claim that science would make. Here are we artists, we show you, we're not suckers. <laughs> you know, you're just ideologically motivated in saying that. And all your optics are politically conceived. And even the technology that you use is military technology anyway, mm-hmm. uh, et cetera, et cetera. Are problematizing the notion of truth, which is absolutely useful. And we're grateful mm-hmm. for museums and the art and critical practices to have taught us that. But is that target of truth still, I mean, in a very simple way, is it still there as a kind of a, a big, fat, you know, repressive thing that needs to be sniped at with like little, uh, you know, um, you know, sort of annoying little kind of arrows, no? Mm-hmm. I don't know what to call like darts or yeah. like little pebbles, no? That don't, don't really can do much to it, but like ding, ding, <laughs> no? <laughs> uh, on, on that, tr- I mean, is that, is that what is necessary right now to do to science, to notions of facticity, et cetera? And I think that, that the fact that, you know, that, that thing exists, uh, you know, that, that thing was invited, uh, to, to Makba is at least enabled by a shift or, or kind of by recognition of the limits of critique as a political practice, mm-hmm. right? The absolute revolutionary uh, move of showing you that you are politically, mot- so that you're politically mm-hmm. colored in a particular way if you have saying this and that. Uh-huh. Okay, great. No, I mean, can we move beyond? Can we agree on that? Of course. What is the next project? How we can move, how we can speak about truth in a way that is much more fragile, that is much more contingent, that is much more situated, that is much more tactical, that is much more uh, important and essential in a particular situation, a particular time and space. And how can we use architecture, the arts, the aesthetic practices to mobilize critical tools um, but in a way that tries to draw the very, very kind of faint contours of the invisible by, because by, by looking at what is visible, right? I mean, when we do all this video stuff, there's a lot of visible things. You know, there's dust and there's this and there's rubble and there's bombs and there's that. But it's always through those little kind of symptoms it's mm. some kind of invisible thing that need to be discovered, no? They're kind of like, you don't know if those peaks that go over the, the water line are the fins of a, of a fish or of a dragon, no? I mean, you don't know. You need, this is exactly what you need to, to know. What are you seeing? What is it? What is it? It's, it's, it's related to what? And, um, and therefore, I think this is, um, it is something that enables in... You know, as aesthetic practitioners, we have developed our own, and we need not to be uh, shy about. And and I don't think it's a returning to connoisseurship of the 18th and 19th century, to say that aesthetic practitioners, that filmmakers, um, could and that that are, that are versed in critical theory of film and photographic mm-hmm. uh, theory, uh, are able to interrogate images. Uh, in a in a different way, not to interrogate the way the image was presented in this newspaper and that newspaper, and haha, you know, this is showing mm-hmm. you that you know that actually, 
the the you know the representation shows you some kind of political we we know that we know we're governed by enormous kind of really powerful ideologies with great um uh techniques it's kind of how do you punch back mm-hmm. you know, in a way can you i mean i don't know it, it's probably also impossible i don't want to sound too heuristic in that but there's a kind of a a desire to try and as much as we can fail on to, uh, on in in the, in the process to use the tools of our trade in order to um uh yeah to to kind of to insert them in a world uh and to make claims upon that 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 would make that equation in which you know in even in all repressive regimes the last thing to close is the art galleries because actually they are inconsequential no i mean and 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 there there is a level of tolerance of what could could happen there and usually it could be fine it's even by very right wing government very sort of left wing let's say mm-hmm. critical uh program this is oh, of course they also are under pressure and they get closed etc cetera, etc cetera, but this is possible mm-hmm. if you're dangerous this is not going to be possible for one minute so so you know i mean we need to ask why we are tolerated for so long why You know what 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 we gave up in order to be tolerated uh, in that extent so I know some some heresies I'm saying here but. Mm-hmm. but I mean you could turn you could shift what you've said to to say um, rather than moving away from the precision of critique that to say that one is uh, always embedded within ideological matrices that mm-hmm. one is always working uh, in conditions in which you power passes through you mm-hmm. um, through and the most one can do is to kind of offer some kind of parallax effect to it is to say actually these these insights of critique that are able to work with very precise detail and very precise levels of scrutiny uh, that are able to show the operations um, of the, the translations of uh, capital into objects for instance or or of patriarchy into uh, the function of institutions. All of these um, can be operationalized, not simply as a way of mapping uh, the powerlessness of, of people, uh, but of, as providing uh, schematics uh, for other kinds of uh, formation to operate. And so this, it's a way of, rather than critique being the basis of, of description of, of powerlessness as uh, critique to be able to describe in a very situated precise and imminent ways uh, with a great deal of rigor where uh, to, to, to focus uh, different forms of force different forms of questioning different forms of invention and I think that's that's possibly one of the things that's offered uh, in this case Uh, this exhibition and and others like it um, so I think that's another question um, that we can think of in relationship to the forms of institutions that might uh, evolve out of this you know to maintain such practices how do we how do we develop institutions how do we develop educational programs is the university adequate or is the university such a Uh, very a kind of very amorphous uh, form of institution that has so many uh, competing interests within it that it's actually very heterogeneous already mm. and is, is useful as a platform or is the the kind of post du champion art space in which anything can be art uh, also another sufficiently heterogeneous space uh, so I think those are those are kind of questions to think about and um, further but one, one of the thing I wanted to pick up was a section from the uh, the end of um, the forensic architecture book mm-hmm. and to think about this question of uh, the split second mm-hmm. and something that's that's really maybe to return us back to the mm-hmm. the uh, this, this case in castle um, the way in which split seconds condense forms and of uh, social injustice, condensed forms of training, condensed forms of the operation of technologies mm-hmm. and institutional uh, behaviors. 
but also work in another phrase that you've used, the, the urbanism of instance. You know, so the way a, a, the particular f- urban forms condense social relations and produce uh, these split seconds. Mm-hmm. And I think this is, this is something that um, again returns to the micro scale mm-hmm. that is looking at the way in which every microscopic interaction between, uh, between entities, every molecular interaction mm-hmm. um, is also a condensation of numerous forms of, of interest, numerous forms of uh, operation that last over long periods of time mm-hmm. also. But the split second is where they become mobilized in particular ways. And there's a particular set of cases um, that you, you work with where you know, institutional forms of violence are given carte blanche because they operate at this scale that is a scale that is also that of intuition. You know, when a police officer decides to uh, shoot someone in the head rather than in the leg, for instance, they do so because um, of of multiple factors. But because they do so in a split second, they're able to uh, be released from responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so there's this mix of the intuitive behavior, trained behavior, and long-term player forces that operates at the level of cities but also operates at the level of institutions Mm -hmm. that is also crystallized um in these split seconds i wonder if you could Mm -hmm. kind of reflect on that and how it relates to uh, a lot of the work of forensic architecture in the exhibition above is really of unpacking the split second Mm -hmm. um and you know if, if we think of what is the what is the method of forensic architecture is it's partly in making seconds last a very long time mm-hmm. um, which is not to say the exhibition is boring by any means <laughs> but we could, we, could, we could say that you really you know you milk those seconds <laughs> and so what is it about uh, what is it about the second that kind of draws your attention yeah so I mean it starts again from a very simple uh, confrontation in understanding a split second differently between police, forensics, and counter forensics. So the police, let's say a policeman has shot uh, a black motorist uh, somewhere in America, as happens almost now every week. Um, the policeman would say, finally, when it, be- it would become clear, when it, be- when it would become clear that there was no reason to shoot, uh, the motorist had no gun, no no intention, no motif to do anything. Uh, the last resource answer to, is to say it was a split second decision of uh, uh, self defense. Split second decision of self defense. I the defense of the police would always be to isolate every bit of violence every bit of shooting, every violation of human rights that is undertaken, say, in Palestine, right? As a single violation, and then when you go down the scale, the single violation becomes the sort of muscle memory. The moment, the split-second argument is used by lawyers in order to undo subjectivity, right? In a single second, whatever subjectivity is, and in particular in relation to law enforcement people, is the ability to calculate, to calculate violence, to say, you know, um, to measure consequences, to evaluate things. The split second empties you out of that subjectivity, and what comes is muscle memory. What comes is an animal, is the animal inside, right? It's the, it's the animal in this mm-hmm. animal-human duality that, that composes people. Right, um, so that that kind of kicks in. So, what where, where that kicks in, you just basically need to interrogate what makes the instinct. Is it a taught instinct? Is the instinct coming from the fact that for generations, white policemen have been taught that black motorists or black people in general are a danger, right? The the, the kind of the conception of 
uh, the black body as a as a violent, dangerous body. It needs to be subdued immediately by all means when it approaches you. Um, and then you find in the instinct, you start finding in as the, the closer you get and you strip it out of duration because split second is not to say half a second, a tenth of a second, even not a thousandth of a second. Split second means an indivisible time, the indivisible time in consciousness, a time that cannot be further down divided. Right? It has, it's a time without duration. It's the pixel of time. Right? So in that moment, um, it is b precisely because the stripping out of all other things is where you find ideology again, is where you find the long durée, is where you find colonial relations, is where you find the history of slavery. And mm -hmm. precisely the work of counter-forensics is to take the split second and to tie it back to the world of which it is part. And then you'd say, what are the relationship between singularity and politics? And 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 uh, and, and then and then then there is various models to say, what's the relationship? No, I mean, we heard from Hannah, we heard from Susan. I mean, you remember the Benjamin quote that was on the wall here? Also did something like that. No, in something like in in a detail, you find the entire world. No, there is the kind of the idea of the. Uh, Mona, there's there's various mm. models in which it's either a reflection of, a representation of, a product of, in a sense of like operating forces condensing into it, or the kind of creative power of the split second to to transform that mm -hmm. which is the world. It's not simply a product; it's a driver, you no, know, within within history, you no, know, in a in a way that kind of. Could could generate various like face transitions, etc., and mm. um, and and others. So, the work is to encounter forensics. The work is always to say, what's the relationship between those seventy-seven square meters and contemporary racism in Europe? Say in our relationship to that, what what is the relationship between the instant and the political? context is it a representational context is it a driver context is it is it is it a metaphor uh, what, what 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 is going on here uh, is it simply that all the forces are at play here I you know and I think that that in a sense the nesting of the moment in time the nesting of the split second in the long duration this pulling out of the strings and what kind of string there? Because there are various models of causality, various mm -hmm. relations that could be, is is really where the kind of the political work need to start. Because sometimes we just would spend, you know, half a year on 44, 44 seconds of video, or on a particular scale, on a particular room. But it's going to stay in that room. It's just going to be a technical exercise in that room if you don't have the political philosophical conception of the relationship between singularity and history and i don't know mm. if you want to i mean it's, uh, listening to you speak it reminds me very much uh, very much of the idea of the history painting in 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 the history of art you know if you think of uh the raft of the medusa or liberty on the barricades or you know in, in the kind of hierarchy of the value of painting the history of pa the history painting the painting that crystallized a moment in history, the forces at play, the actors, uh, the, the, the sense of the event um, was, was seen as the peak of art in some ways. Um, and this is, you know, it's a very kind of classical um, description of art, but it's a way in which a particular representation of a historical event allows one uh, a certain kind of heavily coded access to it. And in a way, what you what forensic architecture is doing is kind of is is taking that model of saying how um, a historical event is mapped by by an image or a set of representations, a set of uh, aesthetic forces, we might say in more contemporary vocabulary, and shows how those are condensed in particular moments in reality, not in not in the field of the painting. And so there's there's a sense in which the mode of the history painting, and this perhaps brings us back to... Um, Ginsburg. Yeah. Well, Ginsburg, but also how, how the institution can, can work with this kind of material, uh, is by thinking about um, new forms of history that work within 
exceedingly brief passages of time, yet also allow us to understand um, history as it's happening in real in real time. So the question of how you can have an aesthetics then that works in real time, uh, can one have an aesthetics? And we've seen, you know, if if, if the short if the uh, split second is the place in which certain modes of sensing, certain modes of training uh, are enacted. Can we have an aesthetic, aesthetic practices, uh, which would be investigative aesthetic practices that also work with split seconds? What is the speed of investigative aesthetics? You know, does it always have to be slow? Does it always have to be in the museum? Can it be uh, enacted in other places? And this this would be interesting to think. Okay, what are the what is the development of methods? What is the development of training that would also work as uh, forms of educational practice? What are the the ways in which one could design almost pipelines of of work for um, to produce a, an investigative aesthetics uh, muscle memory? Mm. You know, to think what it what how could this stuff move into uh, being wider parts of of a wider part of culture, for instance. But uh, I have a question for you, like like really like mm. an, an informative question, because I I'm not sure I get it right, like theoretically. So uh, you you mentioned that Carlo Ginzburg kind of locates the micro history in in larger processes. Um, how does it work there? It seems to me that. Um, there's a big difference between saying, okay, let's investigate the kind of subjectivity that was at play in whatever, 14th century northern Italy mm. uh, through the witch hunt, you know, and kind of like, let's see, let's look at some witch trials, right, witchcraft trial, and see what kind of people lived in Europe. And, and then from those people, we can understand perhaps they're similar to, to other people. It's a sampling, mm. right? It's a kind of sampling. Um, then you have another relation between great history, you know, sort of like long-term history, an event in uh, the Annals School, no? the kind of the undercurrent and the froth on the surface that comes as simply as a consequence of that. But it seems to me that, you know, in both of the approaches, I, I don't know, I mean, but it seems to me that it might be, for, if I'm not mistaken, even if you say that's a sample of people that they live, you say, okay, I'm just actually investigating the undercurrent through the froth, or investigate the froth with the undercurrent in the Annals mm. School, right? But there is that, they are the consequence of history, right? Those people in their lives are the consequence uh, of history. How do you interrogate those moments that are like phase transition, that are, or, or maybe they are, maybe mm. what, what exists in the model of, of, of Ginsburg? How he locates the, the micro in the, the micro in the macro? Mm. I, th I mean, Ginsburg is, is not trying to relate them directly, I think. So if you look at the cheese and the worms, which is his brilliant uh, analysis of the trial transcripts of uh, a, a miller in Friuli in the 15th century, uh, in, as part of the Inquisition, this miller appears twice. And in the second time, he's so insolent to the court that he, he gets put to death. Uh, but in both cases, he gets to make an account of his cosmology and his cat his cosmology is deeply heretical it's fantastic um and it's this this ginsburg makes the claim simply that these things existed that these things are in the world and they're they're self-consistent i think that's um that's all that the claim is made and it's a way of then uh pulling the rug from both positions the both the froth and the depth are really more multidimensional, and that you know that that multidimensionality, uh, the hyperdimensionality we're now becoming familiar with through um, through big data, for instance, is what uh, could also do with some form of of, of aesthetic manifestation. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's that's there's a there's a tension there between those between mm -hmm. those. Um, Insistences that the the microscopic is the most important, or the macro is the most important. Mm -hmm. so. How are we doing with time? I don't know. I do have to finish. Yeah. <laughs> to finish, we just start. It's only Not been a second. Joking. It's only been a second, surely. Mm. <laughs>
But uh, does any should we open a little bit or yeah, not? Yeah. If not, yes. Okay. Thanks for your patience. The survivors. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much because uh, I found this um, whole event and the conversation extremely, extremely useful and fascinating, in fact. Um, so I have a question that I hope um, is not too long or too complicated. Um, I'm a professor of literary theory and of narrative theory, and I do comparative literature. So um, my question is, um, how is storytelling and narrative, so a little bit literature, um, part of this project or potentially part of this project? And I was thinking especially because there's a lot of narrative in, in I guess, in, in this case that you were putting now, um, that you're reconstructing um, the idea that one of the witnesses is not telling the truth. So, like, I'm not sure how that would engage with the visual aesthetics, but there is a lot of work on the relationship between law and literature and the storytelling is happening in cases mm -hmm. like this. And so I'm not sure, but what would be the place of literature as an aesthetic? art related to this um, project? I think it's, it's immense, really. Uh, probably has a lot, a lot a longer history. Um, the whole field of what is now called you know, um, literary nonfiction you know, is, is, is really part of this uh, in some respects. Um, the, the move to documentary theatre uh, certainly that's very strong in the UK at, at present uh, through authors such as David Hare and others I would say is also part of that um, and you could say also some of the, the work in conceptual writing uh, is, is that takes official documents or other sources uh, and simply reads them as literature you know so to read them um, in a way that gives them provides them with aesthetic scrutiny as well as uh, bureaucratic scrutiny, I think is, uh, you know, fundamentally kind of has some sympathies with this, uh, this set of approaches. Mm. I mean, Leon, uh, Leonardo Sciascia, for instance, the, the Moro affair uh, would be another example of like, trying to go through uh, this case of the kidnapping of the Christian Democrat politician and what happened to his, uh, to the letters that he wrote. Um, I'm trying to understand the player forces that are operative there. I think literature has probably been doing this for a long time. Yeah. Something. Somebody. Oh, sorry. Gracias. Thank you both. Uh, <laughs> Something that, that keeps coming back to me, uh, not only in the uh, immense and, and great presentations earlier, but also in your conversation, is how and why does failure kind of get pushed aside? Or, alternatively, what is failure in, in these cases or in these examples? And to me, I think if we were to replace the term, say, practice even with failure, so you could say institutional failure, state failure, mm -hmm. biological or human failure, mm -hmm. and again, compress and expand the, these temporalities to then ask, what is failure? Mm -hmm. um, it, it comes to mind that maybe failure in the case of a forensic aesthetics either presupposes or post, uh, post exists, if that's a, a term. And so I'm wondering about the value of failure and if, val if failure has value uh, in these processes. Yeah, I mean, this is, 
it's a kind of a painful question from some from uh working on the practice that most of our investigations are actually uh, finally um, juridical or human rights failures. And um, it's almost the conditions of the field in which we operate that we will record what we conceive to be uh, the truth despite of knowing that we'll be thrown out of court that if we are in court all the way to the end, we'll be considered clowns by the court, right? And Or they'll, they'll try to disqualify us by our means, consider us unserious, uh, dismiss our evidence, and finally lose the case. And it's a kind of a working despite failure that that uh, allows you on a very immediate level. I know your, your, your question is multi-layered, but I'm, you know, I'm a kind of a literally literal guy. So yeah, failure in that sense. Um, it, it, there's there's also a kind of a long durée question to it. No, we will go on recording as best as we can the death or killing of, let's say, Palestinian kids in the West Bank even though we know there's impunity, even if we know that the next day they're going to kill the other, even if we know we cannot convict those people, which we're going to do it, uh, because there's value in the kind of, in, also in itself, in sort of in a respect to a life lost, in respect to an evidence produced under uh, dangerous conditions, I, in a respect to the fact that somebody who's taken that video is risking their life to take that video. That uh, taking it and reading is the least you can do when somebody's writing you a postcard, right? So you need to read it as carefully as it has been written. Uh, so these are not postcards, these are much more desperate kind of uh, attempt to get uh, information out. And that, but, but failure is built into um, political analysis and political activism always always exists in the, in the short run. It's always it's, it's part of it. Without that, there is no possible even the idea and let's not delude ourselves that we have some formula to, to, to change kind of political forces, but to make any move fundamental, um, you need to keep on failing. You need to keep on getting at it. And that is uh, something that is important. In relation to institutional failure and state failure, there is an assumption in it that there is uh, a good way to be governed, um, that there is an enlightened uh, institution or an enlightened police. Uh, many In many situations, we believe you need to develop an abolitionist relation to the military and the police and the internal services rather than a reformative one. The minute you would say for Fasung Schutz is a terror organization, mm -hmm. uh, the Israeli police for Palestinians is a terror organization, the Israeli military in relation to Palestinians is a terror organization, whatever, I mean, the, the example in Guatemala, etc. This is not that you need to, um, it's not, you're not speaking about institutional failure. You, you, you're speaking about, uh, uh, you know, an institution just ne need to completely exist in a different form, cannot exist in the way that it, uh, that it does because of the paradoxes in the way that they see the common good and doing investigation at the same time. I mean, that, that's kind of like the Foucauldian diagram, right, of the police. Mm -hmm. Uh, although he was not speaking about investigation, but you see that you know, the police as the kind of the management of happiness, right? I think that's this mm -hmm. kind of part of the argument, isn't it? Um, of felicity, you know, the well-being and happiness of the population, the common good of it, while being in charge of knowledge. Right? Mm -hmm. that, is, that means the minute that, that these things exist and those two things are held by the state, you're entering into an abolitionist trajectory that cannot exist. It cannot be done better. There's a paradox. Mm -hmm. 
I think there's another. I mean, there's another dimension uh, of failure that I think I follows really from Susan's work on the material witness, and that is that the failure um, is, in a certain sense, a condition of, of, of truth. That the failure of a video camera to receive uh, light waves with a, a particular level of acuity, without producing glitches or interference, uh, is also part of its um, condition of veracity. And you know this is a, a fundamentally uh, aesthetic problematic, in that the mediation and, as Michel Serre would put it, the translation of a light wave through a charge coupled device, through a series of algorithms to a screen uh, via a codec, um, is always a failure. Is a, is a loss of information at a certain level, but it's also an addition of information in that one can read the, the processes of that transmission, that translation. And part of the question of, uh, of digital culture is learning to read those failures as informationally rich and culturally meaningful. Uh, so when we start to, to look at the way in which algorithmic processes, data structures, uh, programming languages and so on, also take part in these translations, uh, these are the kinds of things that are partially failures, but they're also uh, able to add information uh, that we can we can see as important. Uh, actually, there was another. So maybe, yeah. I mean, we, we'll hear both and we'll answer together or respond, not answer. Uh, thank you very much for the three presentations. They were great. And this is uh, more a comment. Um, hearing all them, I was uh, thinking uh, about um, feminicides and how, um, how much productive this uh, method you are um, offering and making visible for us would be for these cases, I think, uh, about um, also uh, concepts of uh, the um, presentations like uh, slow violence. And you uh, spoke about um, how an incident uh, put together things. I was uh, thinking on this uh, crime scenes we see on the uh, on the newspapers where a body was killed and there were are trees and they are um, a body i mean a woman um, and there are uh, maybe maybe houses and 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 things objects and uh, well uh, and also because um this uh, gender thing has to do with uh, with the concept of forensics too, because uh, the speaking at the photo was a forbidden uh, uh, action for women among other people. No? So maybe uh, my question is uh, if uh, you are thinking about uh, or you already had the opportunity to work with uh, with that this kind of cases thank you Okay, thank you. Um, I have two questions. The one um, goes to how do you position yourself um, towards functions of the art field, like in special the collection, like accumulating value? Um, have you ever been approached um, of by somebody who was interested in collecting or somehow integrating a forensic architecture's investigation into a collection? How would this look like? and also how it would um, transform the canon of um, contemporary art. And the other question is, how, um, how does you as, an, as a political actor, how does it, is it transformed by you being exhibited 
within contemporary art entering with this um, juridical rhetoric. Mm -hmm. Thank you for both questions. I mean, uh, there's another one. If there is another one, it will be the last one. Um, okay, let, 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 let's start with uh, the question about uh, gender-based violence, uh, etc. And I think that um, in many of our cases, um, there is a dimension of that, especially in uh, war zone situation, um, where domestic violence is not um, a violence that is kind of in the house, between uh, uh, within the family, but something that um, effectively target those that remain in a particular building. And in a strange way, you see it increasingly um, casualties inside buildings, um, civilian casualties inside buildings, um, and families that are being targeted and, and killed. So this is something that we, that we look at um, increasingly. Um, and and think about that aspect. There was a case where we have uh, Susan and I were in where was it Düsseldorf when we went, and uh, we've interviewed uh, a woman who was traveling uh, with some members of her family, a husband and some others, to Pakistan, and um, effectively the the targeting of the house that she recalled from memory uh, was very much to do with the kind of gender division inside uh, the house. She was, in that particular moment of the strike, she was confined to a very small area at the back of the house. She mentioned it's a drone strike. There was a drone strike in Pakistan that killed uh, members of her family. And um, in fact, the you could read through the sort of the targeting and the and the architecture of destruction also the entire kind of architecture of the house as a kind of gender division and exclusion um, within it so i mean there, there's there's many other examples and each one has a different aspect that we could uh, also discuss in relation to art and uh, collecting uh, etc i i actually you know this the the thing is that we the, in our encounter with art uh, and its institutions and uh, its biennales and museums and you know uh, documentas etc is one in which it is really what we think about is on what term do you do we want the encounter to be rather than how we end up in a, in a basket or in a sack or in a bag of the way in which art like to think about its products and it's about display. So when we come to a place like the Makba, with its uh, incredibly productive history of, you know, sort of 80s onward, uh, political and documentary art, work on archives, uh, critical work with collections, etc., that is happening here, there's a dialogue that, that, that starts between, um, you know, our relation to document uh, our relation to image, uh, our relation to display, how, do, how we could, how a museum is not only a place in which you display work, but you interrogate display or interrogate a very act of seeing. So it's not only about seeing the work, it's how it becomes a kind of an, an encounter between a curatorial system, machine or not, or institution that kind of arranges works, archives, ideas in space-time in our kind of curatorial approach that arranges them and make other claims with them and interrogate vision in a different way. So the, it, what we're thinking about is that moment of encounter rather than what we can get out of it in the sense of a productive exchange, no? And that is uh, an interesting thing. Uh, 
often we use also commissions such as documenta such as here to further work so it's not only the production budget on a very sort of straightforward way is not only put in 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 terms of like how to ship stuff and print stuff and convert from you know whatever file to another file but how how we are able to to use the exhibition as a kind of an extension of our studio work okay so you know an exhibition like that would come with several uh, thousands euros in, in budget not too much but that is uh, we'd always think of what we can do with that to further an investigation if we don't do that it makes no sense for us to do it uh, it's we, we have no inherent interest to to show in the art context we interested in the exchange both an intellectual exchange and on a practical level on on using the museum as a kind of a extension of our lab so that is what I have to say. I have to say many more things, and it sounds like there's a good conversation to be had. But right now, that what 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 are your thoughts? Mm. I, I mean, I think another approach is to treat the museum as a as a media system that has different kinds of capacities. So don't don't treat the media the the, the museum as an institution anymore, but treat it uh, as if it were uh, something that can clarify certain functions that can speed things up slow things down zoom in and out of uh different uh different kinds of information provide spaces for uh certain kinds of encounter i think that that's how the museum should be should be understood in the present uh rather than as a as, as a as an institution that produces canons um and then produces you know subsidiary values from those that then become market uh market values and other kinds of derivatives um, as regard the you know the the question of how forensics can um, do uh, do feminist work and and kind of engage with with patriarchy as part of its uh, systematic working, I think the the episode that that um, AI was talking about is is useful. But I think there's also things that um, investigative aesthetics can learn from uh, the kinds of spatially based quantitatively based work that feminists have been doing uh over the last hundred years and particularly uh over the last few decades where um this when the, the work is not simply to talk about uh the you know a fundamental logic of, of feminism is to say this is not an individual experience this is an experience of multiple uh multiple kinds of people and from that, it becomes uh, also possible to do quantitative work when you start to see patterns arising and people recognize uh, each other's conditions. I think that might be a way to develop some of the kind of uh, techniques in, in forensics uh, and counter forensics is to think about how do you make it uh, social? How do you uh, add this kind of network multiplier of recognizing that it's not simply an individual event, but it's something that is systematic and it happens systematically to certain categories of persons. Very good. Thanks for your patience. Okay, thanks.